Welcome, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, covenant partners all over, wherever you're watching us from, wherever you're joining us from, we take this moment as a precious moment as we get together and look into the Word of God. I love this kind of uh, a, a setup and this kind of teaching where we just bring the Word of God down to where we are. Please kindly let me know where you're watching me from, where you're joining me from, and please let's have an interaction uh, put your comments there, and uh, if you have any prayer requests, we want you to feel free to send them to us, and we'll be able to pray with you. And also, for those of you that are in our area here in Kitwe, Zambia, you are visiting in Kitwe, wherever, uh, whatever has brought you here, please feel free to visit us. Um, our church is right behind the Copper Belt University. That's um, uh, off Chuala Road, CBU Eastgate. Welcome. We love you and we appreciate every single moment that you take into this uh, broadcast. Let us pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we pray that you lead us and you guide us in our discourse today. We ask of the presence of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit to be upon us. And God, may we lead your people to the place where you want them to be, not to the place of our choice, but to the place that you have ordained. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue with our series and our discussion on, the, on pain. We, we are, we, we've been talking about different degrees and different categories of pain. Uh, today, I want us to talk about something very serious, which we, is going to be the topic called the pain of truth. The pain of truth. We are living at a time, ladies and gentlemen, when faith is being watered down and it is almost non-existent. And if you and I are going to be truthful, if you and I are going to choose to stand on the ground of truth, let us know that it's not going to be a popular uh, position that we take. Let's get into the scriptures that are going to form the basis of our discourse today. And that is going to be the book of John, John chapter 14, verse 6, and then we come to John chapter 8, verse 31 and verse 32. So John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said to, to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this scripture, Jesus is responding uh, to one of his disciples, Thomas. He was asking, where are you going? Who are you? And everything like that. And then Jesus tells him that he was the way, he was the truth, and he was the life. And that no one could go to the Father except through Jesus Christ. I will explain why this scripture is very important and why it is not a very simple statement that Jesus makes. Let's look at uh, John chapter 8, verse 31 and verse 32. The Bible says, then Jesus answered to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, and uh, let me read again. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So these are the two scriptures that we are going to look at. These are the two scriptures that are going to form uh, the basis of our discourse today. Why this scripture is important is because at the time that uh, Jesus was saying this, the Jewish people were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the Son of God to come. And so here is a carpenter's son. Here is a young man. In fact, Jesus is a young man. They are people who have lived longer than him. They were people who were in their 60s and probably 80s who knew more according to, 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 to the Torah, who knew probably more were more experienced, who found it very difficult to believe this young man who claimed to be the son of God, to be the Christ. And then he says, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life, no one goes to the Father except through me. Now, here is the point of contention. The point of contention is that before Jesus, you were born, um, our fathers, or us who are older than you, we still had access to the Father. We were still sons of God. Like they said, we are Abraham's seed. How do you come to tell us that you can free us? So it is a controversial statement that Jesus makes because these guys have been existing in the, in the culture of their traditional worship and they were getting along with it so well. But Jesus now begins to say there's a new way of accessing the Father. And what is Jesus is saying is the Father has changed the way of worship. He says... The way of worship is not through the law. It's going to be through me. And now they know who this guy is. They know that he was just born 33 years ago. They know that this guy is just uh, uh, Joseph's son. They know that he, he is uh, Mary's son. They know his brothers and his sisters. And then he says, I am the only way. That is not a small statement. Then answering again, to the pressure that was building around him when, whenever he taught. In John chapter, th- chapter 8, verse 31 and verse 32, again Jesus makes a statement. He says uh, to those who believe in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So what Jesus is again insinuating from this point of view is that you needed to abide in what he said. Now remember, what Jesus was saying at that moment was not documented. He was not reading a script. He was saying things as they came, as they came into his spirit. He was not reading something that was written for him. He was just saying things. And so the hearers at that moment did not have the Bible that you and, have, you and I have today, where we quote and say, Jesus said the following. Jesus was saying it and people were hearing it for the first time. And so when he tells them that you need to abide in my word, in other words, make my words become the basis of your access to the Father. Or my words are without error. My words are are eternal. So they are trying to say, who do you think you are? Let's also establish that one thing that sent Jesus Christ to the cross was the assertion that he made that he was the son of God. Jesus did not die because of the sins that he committed. The reason why the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Roman, uh, the Roman soldiers decided to kill Jesus was on the premise that he claimed to be the son of God. So now you have to understand with the background that we have established here that whatever Jesus said was interpreted through many channels. And even if it was you who lived at that moment, I don't think you would believe what you have believed today. You would probably have been the first person to have cast a stone at him because it sounded like it was heresy. They were waiting for a Messiah who was going to come in a dramatic way, who was going to come with angels. But here comes a young guy who is just born of an ordinary birth. Okay, ordinary in the sense that at least it was through birth. He did not just come from heaven and drop from the skies. In fact, his birth was hidden. It was not public. And when he begins to make these assertions or these claims, it became a very... Difficult thing for the people who lived at that moment. But the thing that we have to again stress is that Jesus was right. Jesus was right. Regardless of how controversial those statements sounded, regardless of how self-serving those statements sounded at, at that moment, regardless of how prideful he may have looked at that moment, regardless of how insensible he sounded, regardless of how out of his mind he may have looked, he was right. I want to make a statement as we move forward that normally, If you want to live in truth, it is not a life of popularity. It is not a road of fame. fame. It is a road of loneliness. Remember, the Bible says um, Jesus now began to lose his disciples, including his disciples started running away from him. 
when he began to talk about the fact that people needed to eat his flesh and they needed to drink his blood. Now, that no one talks like that. And in the process, people who followed him started living. They said, he's out of his mind. And then he turns to Peter and the rest of uh, the other disciples who remained. He said, are you also going to run away from me? Are you also going to walk away from me? And Peter answered and said, where can we go? For you have the words of life. So it was not a famous uh, a position of Jesus. It was not a, um, a, a, uh, a prestigious journey that Jesus Christ took. I want to uh, say that we are living at a time, ladies and gentlemen, when truth is no longer truth as it used to be. There is... <coughs> Um, I don't know if I can call it theology, uh, but let me say there is a position that has emanated over a period of time. It is a thought or a theology or an idea that is referred to as, uh, uh, they call it relativism. In this statement or in this word relativism, I'm going to... Uh, try to say what they say, and then I'm going to explain a little further. It is a doctrine that asserts or that suggests that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context, and are not absolute. By this relativism, what is insinuated or what is strongly suggested or proclaimed is that there is no absolute truth. Meaning that whatever you stand on what you claim to be truth, it is not truth. They say it is truth based on your culture, based on your understanding. It is based on the moral existence of your, of your context of, of existence. So when we look at all these things, and that is why when you go to certain countries in the West, they, they live their lives in a particular way because of this um, ideology that has taken root. And I want to tell you that very soon, our, our valued position in terms of morality and Christianity is going to erode soon. Let me give another example. Through the same understanding of relativism, you see that this idea has permeated the body of Christ today with the people who are advocates of grace. I am an advocate of grace, but I'm not in extreme. The people who are in the extreme position advocating for grace, they say that once you are born again, you can do whatever you can do and you can never lose your salvation. There are so many believers who right now who don't believe that sexual immorality is sin. There are so many believers who believe that lust is not a sin. They believe that there's nothing that you can do that can cost your life. They, they don't believe that you can go to hell. It is all emanating from the same thing. But what I read from the word of God, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says these people who do the following, which includes sexual immorality, idolatry, and you mentioned them. The Bible says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So what we see is the gospel is being watered down. God is looking for a remnant. God is looking for you and I. If we are going to be the ones who are going to protect the integrity of the word of God, are we going to be the ones who are going to stand and say, thus saith the Lord? Remember, in the book of Revelations, the Bible says, you shall not add nor subtract from what is written in the word of God. You cannot preach any other gospel other than what has been uh, already taught in the scriptures of God. I was going to explain quite a lot, but because of time, let's get into much of what we want to look at today. So we understand now what relativism means and why we have the issues that we have around. In fact, with the same issue of relativism, they suggest that there's nothing wrong with you marrying someone who is of the same sex as you are. 
It is all right because the issue of marriage is, in, is uh, interpreted through the context of culture. It is not the issue of what the word of God says. They are now substituting the word of God with culture. Now remember, the problem with culture is that culture changes. But the word of God never changes. The word of God is constant. So just look at our culture. Let's say in Africa, in Zambia. Over the past decade or two, we have seen how we have shifted from what we used to be. How our traditions have changed and how our culture has embraced the Western culture. So culture changes, but the word of God remains the same. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me also say that Jesus is not, not Bemba. Jesus is not Lozi. Jesus is not Namwanga, maybe Namwanga. Jesus is not Lenje. Jesus is not Lamba. Jesus is God. He is God over everybody. And so you cannot take God to be your tribe's mate. He is not. And you cannot understand God based on your tribe. He is above that. And so culture changes. The word of God never changes. And so when we talk about the pain of truth, once you stand on the truth of the word of God, once you stand on the truth of the culture of God, remember again when we talk about culture, we do not practice the culture of our tribes as Christians. Yes, we pay attention to that. But our primary culture is the culture of the kingdom of God. In the culture of the kingdom of God, we talk about give and it shall be given unto you. In the culture of, God, of the kingdom of God, we talk about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. In the culture of God, we talk about love your enemies as you love yourself. You know, we talk about all, the, all these things that are not the same according to our tribal cultures. So now, having laid this foundation, we want to say that living a life of truth is a lonely path. There are some of you who may have lost stuff, who may have lost relationships because you stood on the truth. Let me also say that in order for you to have God's protection and God's uh, uh, backing, you need to practice his culture. You need to live a life of truth. Remember, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It is only the truth of God's word and the truth of God's kingdom that protects you. It is the only truth that sets you free because sometimes man can say you are right when you are wrong. But when God says you are right and you are right, I tell you what, you've got all the heavenly resources backing you. And so... Let's look at the seven types of lies. The seven types of lies which we find ourselves are being sapped into. We have been absorbed into at least one of the seven lies that I want us to look at real quick. Number one. Number one, it is the lie of error. A lie of error which is a lie by mistake. The person believes truthful, but what they are saying is not true. So it is an error. For example, there are so many people who preach the word of God. I have heard people genuinely preaching the word of God not correctly. It's full of error, but they don't intend to, leave, to lead anyone astray or into error. They don't just have a good understanding about it. And we have found ourselves in such errors before. Time and again, we have seen or found ourselves where we are saying something that is not accurate. For example, with the COVID-19 that is going on right now, there are so many people who are making suggestions, who are trying to uh, make some interpretations with what is going on, but their assertions, their, their uh, point of view is not correct. It's not accurate. They are not intentionally intending to lead anyone astray, but they are just trying to give what they know. So in that kind of lie, there's a little understanding, humanly speaking. Number two, it is the lie of omission, which means leaving out relevant information easier and least risky. It doesn't involve inventing any stories. 
it is passive deception unless guilty in, uh, is involved. So it is a way where someone is giving a story and then they leave out something that they feel is not supposed to be added in that story, but it is part of the story. Let me say, let me call it half-truth to be correct. It is half-truth where someone describes an event of how good it was. Or, no, no, maybe that is, that is good. Let me say how bad it was. It, it's an event that took place and there were negatives that happened, but there were positives as well. So when they give a report, they will report based on what their minds is bent toward. They will describe how it failed. They will leave out the positives out of that. So they omit the truth out of the report. Number three. It is a lie that we can call restructuring. Distorting, which means uh, distorting the context. Saying something in, sarc in sarcasm, changing the characters, or the altering of the scene. Where now this is an intentional lie, where someone changes what you said. They give it another meaning. They restructure it. They are changing the context and the content of what was involved in that. There are so many people, believers for that matter, and of course non-believers, who change the story to suit the hearers. And you also have to appreciate that people love lies more than they love truth. If you are truthful, you're boring. When you're telling a story, you have to put what was not there. The fourth level of lies is what we would call denial. That is refusing to acknowledge a truth in a matter. They just deny and sideline the truth that was involved in the happening. For example, when Jesus was accused of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they decided to deny all the good things that he did. They called him all sorts of names, but they never called him the healer. They never called him a mercy giver. They never called him a loving Jesus. They put all sorts of negatives on him. They denied every good thing that Jesus did. The next level, I guess, uh, is number five. Minimization. Reducing the effects of a mistake. A fault or a judgment call. When you know something is wrong, uh, let me give an example. Someone has done something wrong and you're like, ah, no, it's okay, it's okay. I see, you know, these things happen, but you know, it is something that you need to call out. And I'm not talking about you being judgmental. I'm just talking about where you hold someone accountable. When someone says something about another person that is improper, you have to hold them accountable. You cannot say, no, it's okay, I understand. You see, these things happen. No, you are not being truthful. The next level is exaggeration. Rep uh, representing as greater, better, or experienced, or more successful when you exaggerate your position or exaggerate a story. Something happened or you, you have to present yourself and the introduction that you give yourself is exaggerated. Lastly, it is fabrication. Now, this is a very advanced level. This is deliberately inventing a false story. I hope you and I have come across people who have just fabricated a story. And in this country, and of course everywhere, we, 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 we know what it means. People can even riot over fabrications. You may be a victim of a fabricated story. Someone told a story about you, a bad story that never happened. They are people whose marriages have been lost because someone fabricated a story 
that you were being unfaithful to your partner. And that led to so much trouble. Even in church, we have fabricated stories about pastors. In fact, pastors, let me, let me defend pastors just for a second. Pastors are the most victimized people. Because in church, sometimes we have people who don't just like the pastor. They love the church, but they don't love the pastor. They can do anything to get rid of the pastor. I just want to let you know that you never appointed that pastor. You never called that pastor. And it's a dangerous game to play. If God is comfortable with them, leave them. If you're not comfortable with them and you're not comfortable being around them, find another church. That is a very godly advice I can give you. Find another church. Other than you fabricating stories about a man of God that never happened. And I'm not saying men of God are, are without fault. We are full of fault. We are full of mistakes. But please, don't you dare fabricate a story about another human being. No matter how much you don't like them. No matter how much they have hurt you in the past. You cannot afford to fabricate a story about them. What is the purpose of a lie? Because everything we do has got a purpose. There's something that we want to achieve. So when we fabricate a story or when we tell a lie, there is a reason behind. I would probably just suggest one general reason why we tell lies, which is to deceive. We tell lies to deceive. If you are in trouble, you tell lies to deceive so that you get out of trouble. If you have mismanaged funds, you lie to deceive the auditors. So we tell lies necessarily to deceive either to escape punishment or to achieve or attain favor. But I want you to know that Anything obtained through wickedness or crookedness does not last. It doesn't have God's backing. The only thing that stands, it is what is built on truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Again, Jesus said, I am the way, the life and the truth. No one comes to the Father except by me. Anything you have obtained through crookedness or through untruthfulness, it doesn't have God's protection. It can disappear the same way it came. But I want to challenge you, child of God, that in these days, if we are going to be the true disciples of God, if we are going to be the true representatives of God, we need to stand on the word of truth. We need to say nothing less than truth. I know truth is very painful. Truth sometimes can cost you everything, and I'm going to talk about that in a little while. Truth is expensive, I can say. But this generation and the kingdom of God is seeking for men and women who are ready to lose anything for truth. Men and women who can not achieve to be caught in a trap of lies. Remember, the word of God is in you. And the word of God is truth. Remember, the word in you is God himself. It's Jesus in, in, himself in you. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. For he was with God in the beginning. All things were created by him and through him. Nothing that is created uh, would be created if it was not for him. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld this glory. Of the word of God. Let the word of God rule in your life. It is only the word of God that is truthful. It is only the word of God that can stand the test of time. We are living in a very difficult time. Remember heaven does not back anything that is less than truth. If you want God to be on your side. You've got to be on the side of truth. Let me mention a few things that will happen if you stand by the word of truth or by truth. Or what would be the consequences of truth? Number one, truth threatens long-standing cultural beliefs. Truth 
threatens long-standing cultural beliefs. So, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. We can build a culture of lies. And in the culture of lies, everyone who grows up in there, those who are born in this culture, then they know that the way of life is by being untruthful. Let me give another example. Very, very familiar to us in this nation. Not only to this nation, but all over the world. We are living in a dispensation of corruption. Corruption has become normal. Especially in our country here. To bribe someone, it is so natural. It doesn't even take you a thought about it. You don't, you don't even give it a thought. You don't even, even blink when, when, when you are bribing just to get out of trouble. Even to obtain favor. You don't want to stay in a queue for, for, for a long time. You just know how to give someone something and they give you a favor. Now, that has become a norm. It is a cultural normal. And so our children who are being brought up in this kind of culture, they will never know that it is wrong to bribe. They will never know that corruption is wrong. They will never know that God is against corruption. And most of us believers are involved in this. So it is, uh, with, it is with lies. When we build a culture of lies, the children that we are raising the children that are coming up after us will never know any truth. The lies will become truth. If you are living in a home where insults are normal, where insults have become the normal language, you'll be insulting and it, it will be normal. Let me give an example. Just go to the stations, bus stations, where we have these cowboys, where we have these guys uh, uh, who are out of control. They call each other by insults. They insult each other's parents and it's a joke. It's a culture around there. So it, they don't even get offended when they're insulted because it is a culture they have built. And so when now you stand up to speak the truth, that truth will threaten the long-standing culture of that environment. And believers, the Bible says we are the sort of the earth. What that means is we have to go where there is wrongness where there is untruthfulness and speak the truth, that way we are applying the sword. We are applying the light where there is darkness. Remember, lies are all a product of darkness. You cannot join in telling lies. You cannot join in distorting the truth. Then you are applying darkness. When you speak truth, you are applying the light of God. The number two consequence of truth is that it uncovers lies. And if it uncovers lies, then that means you are in trouble with the people who taught lies. Because they are businesses that are built on lies. They are, are, are factories that are run on lies. Or they are organizations and ministries and political parties, systems and cultures that operate on lies. So the moment you uncover the lies, the moment you tell the truth, you uncover all the lies. And trust me, they'll come after your throat. They will come after your throat. And remember, these guys have got more financial strength than you are. Remember, these guys have got connections than you do. Remember, these guys have got system support. To some degree, they even have state support. And so if you rise up and say, I'm going to tell the truth, I'll tell, it, I'll, tell, I'll tell it as it is, their wrath will come upon you. Don't you wonder, don't you wonder, just think for a moment, look at the caliber of the political people that we have. Look at the caliber of the people who have led us at constituency level, at branch level, at national level. You just look at that. You will notice you will notice that some of them, if we were just to be honest and truthful, they cannot make office. They cannot get into office. But because they are supported by a system of lies, they get into office. Not only that, 
We love lies more than truth. We look around amongst other political parties and amongst just even outside political parties. We know they are individuals who can make good leaders. They are truthful. They are honest. They are transparent. But in our society that is rotten, they don't make good leaders. Because we want someone who's going to give us something behind the back. It is a rotten culture. It is a rotten system. And I stand boldly to say that in order for us to call ourselves a Christian nation, we need to address the lies that have ruled our nations. I am calling us as people of God to stand on the truth of what God has said. Number three consequence of truth. It costs relationships that have been built over a long period of time. It costs relationships. Once you tell the truth, those people that are involved in the lie will become your enemies. You lose friends when you stand for truth. Some of you, it is at your place of work. You know who did wrong. And you know that other people are being punished for what went wrong. You know the person who's responsible for that theft. But you have zipped your mouth because you don't want to lose relationships. You don't want to lose relationships. But what does it, what does it benefit you to win a temporary relationship and lose God's trust? Other innocent people are being punished, and yet you know the truth. What am I talking about? We need to return to the culture of truth. We need to return to the place where we tell nothing but the truth. Man's opinion is nothing compared to the truth of the word of God, compared to the truth that protects us. As a country, what really brings us together, what protects us, and what leads us and guides us is truth, not lies. Let me conclude by discussing three important lies that the enemy has taught. Three or four. Let me see how much time I've got. I want to take you through this. And these are the lies that have altered your life. Lie number one. You have told yourself, the enemy has whispered into your ears and into your mind, and you have told yourself that you are not important. I have met people who are convinced they are not important, who are convinced they are useless. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Let me tell you that God never made anything that is useless, including the animals, including all creatures and all plants. They are all important, but you, you are not a plant. You are not an animal. You are created in the image of God. God took time to create you and God took time to put destiny in your life. But the enemy has come to whisper into your ears like he did in the Garden of, uh, in the garden of Eden by saying to our father, did God say that? That's what the enemy has said to you. Did God say to you, you are important? No, you are not important. I came to diffuse that lie by the power of God. The devil is a liar. You are important. The Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Because once you don't understand that you are important, you live recklessly. Once you, 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 you believe that you are not important, you don't pay attention to what you do. Listen to me. Dress up. Talk well. Walk well. Plan well. You are important. Heaven backs you. You are important child of God. Number two. Lie number two. The enemy has whispered into your ears that you are not good enough. That you are not good enough. Listen. God's uh, uh, strength is perfected in our weaknesses according to scripture. You may be full of weaknesses. You may not be as smart as other people. You may not really compete at that level. But I came to tell you that you are good enough. The one who made you knows who you are. And listen to me, through your weaknesses, you can rise to the place of prominence. 
You can strengthen your weaknesses. There are some of us who have even stopped trying. We have stopped living for a purpose because we have convinced ourselves that we are good. We are not good enough. We have convinced ourselves that there is nothing good that can come out of us. Even when there is a discussion, you may be the brilliant mind with a brilliant idea in that moment, but you never say a word because the enemy has told you you're not good enough. The enemy has told you your background is not good enough. Your education is not good enough. Your finances are not good enough. Listen to me. The Bible says Jesus became poor so that we can become rich. In other words, Jesus became a weakness so that he can strengthen our weaknesses. You can rise from your weakness. You can rise from the place of loneliness and you can rise from the place of, of, of non-insignificance and you can rise to a place of prominence. You are good enough. God made you good. Lie number three. The enemy has whispered in your ears that you do not have what it takes. The enemy has told you that you do not have what it takes. Listen to me. My Bible tells me that God has equipped you and I with everything that pertains to life and godliness. All the resources that you need are in you. All the treasures of heaven are in you. Before you got to the place where you are stuck, God had already provided a way out. The Bible says to every temptation, there is a way out. As long as you have God on your side, you have what it takes. As long as you have the word of God in your life, you've got what it takes. There is something in you, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If I were you, after listening to this message, I'll get a pen and I'll get a paper and I'll begin to plan. I'll begin to write my vision. I'll begin to write my destiny. I'll begin to look at myself as someone who is important. Lie number four, and I close with this. The enemy has whispered into your ears and you have believed that nothing can change for you. Nothing can change for you and about you. So what you have done is you have hit the last nail of the coffin over your head. You have buried yourself. You are dead before you die. You have lost the power to try. You have lost the power to plan. You have lost the power to think. I came to challenge you from the word of God that the devil is a liar. In fact, the Bible says he is the father of all lies. He's been, uh, he's been the liar from the beginning. There is no truth that comes out of him. So if he tells you that nothing will change, in fact, you need to remind him that devil, it is you for whom nothing will change. Because you'll never be forgiven, you'll never enter heaven, you'll never marry, you'll never have children. It is you, nothing will change. But for you, child of God, God is with you and God is on your side. There is no situation that is permanent. There's no condition that is permanent. Whatever you consider to be a, a, a mountain around you, the Bible says, even a mountain when you apply faith, you can combine it and say, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and it shall obey you if you do not doubt. There is no situation that is permanent. Listen to me. Your life that is full of trouble, no money, no house, no wife, no husband, no nothing, it can change. I know the, 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 the songwriter says, I know the master of the wind. I know the maker of the rains. He can cause the wind to shift in a moment. And I want to speak prophetically for you that God is shifting the season for you. God is shifting the wind for you. God is doing something for you. What it will take for you to get out of your situation is just by you embracing the truth, discarding all the lies that the enemy has heaped around you and believe the truth of the word of God. Let me say that it is more costly to live a life of lies than it is to live a life of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if Jesus is the way, then he's the truth and he's the life. In other words, if you live a life of truth, then you go to the Father. And remember, what is in the Father's bosom? All the blessings are there. All the blessings are there. I came to encourage you today that you don't need to live a life of lies. You have reduced yourself to calling yourself, I'm just a housewife. Because you believe that you cannot do anything productive. You have convinced yourself that I am just a garden boy. You have convinced yourself that nothing can change. I came to remind you that the enemy is a liar. Only God is truthful to what he says. Only God is the source of truth. And it is only God who can change your destiny by the truth of his word. Not by the circumstances, but by the truth of his word. I want to pray with you right now. Those of you who need further prayers, please, you can get in touch with us. Just let us know what you need us to pray for and we'll stand with you. Heavenly Father, we pray that God let the truth that is in your heart saturate our hearts, saturate our minds, saturate our culture, saturate our environment. Lord, we destroy the strongholds of the enemy, the strongholds of lies. We speak the truth of the word of God. May the truth come out stronger than the power of lies in Jesus' name. And I pray for you who is living a life of lies. I pray for you who is hurting from lies. I pray for you who's lost everything because of lies. May you recover all in Jesus' mighty name. May your marriage change. May everything change around you in Jesus' mighty name. We pray for a good and new restart for your life in Jesus' name. And we pray for you also. We give you an opportunity. You have never prayed to receive Jesus Christ. Listen to me. The life that you are living without Christ is a life of lies. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. You've got to know Jesus Christ. The money that you may have, the marriage that you may have, the relationships that you may have are all temporal. They cannot take you to Christ. They cannot take you to, to the Father. Only through Jesus Christ can you access the peace of the Father. And I want to give you this opportunity. You're saying, I want to know Jesus. I want to know the truth and live the life of truth. I want to invite you by just praying this prayer with me. Simply say, Heavenly Father, I accept the truth of your word. I accept the truth of Christ. I accept the truth of the kingdom of God. I accept the truth that Jesus came, lived here on earth, died for me, and rose from the dead. I believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Forgive my sins in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are a child of God. Find a Bible-believing church and hook yourself to that church. If you are within Kitwe, we are just situated opposite or behind CBU. Just come and have fellowship with us. We love you all. Thanks for joining. And we say from the Victory family, my name is Cyrus. We love you until we see you again at the same time. Bye-bye for now.